right, and we are live. Jim, thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? Oh, you know, I'm living the dream, and the dream lives on every day. I couldn't be any better. Thanks. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, yeah, thank you for joining us today on, uh, on our episode. Um, to get us started, why don't you just tell everybody, you know, who you are, um, where you're from, and, uh, and a little bit about um, your background in real estate, how you got started in real estate. Uh, well, we have very limited time, and I'm a man of many stories, <laughs> but uh, I, my name is Jim Freeman, and I'm a real estate broker and an investor in a little community west of Seattle. It's called Port Orchard, Washington, Kitsap County. And, uh, you know, I, my real estate career as such began all the way back in 1975. So I've been through at least four, now maybe five coming real estate recessions. And uh, I, I uh, started uh, while I was still a student at the University of Washington, living in a student ghetto. Uh, and it's a better story if I had more time to tell it. But uh, when I was still going to school, I had a part-time job. I, I had a scholarship to go to school to pay my tuition. Okay. But I had to make, earn enough money to buy beer and pay rent. Yeah, of course. And, of course. Uh, and I, you know, went to work for this guy who was a Vietnam veteran. He just got back from Vietnam. And he was uh, buying uh, a, the, the great number of foreclosure properties that were available in Seattle in 1975. And I worked with him a little bit. And uh, I bought a, I, so I, I learned sort of some trade skills from him. I bought a duplex in 1975 on Queen Anne Hill on Garfield Street. How much did you buy it for? Queen Anne, that is some prime property up there. 1975, what would you buy in it 1975, for? 1975, I paid, if I remember right, it was around 20, 21,000. Oh man, that's guaranteed that's worth at least 1.5 million at this point. Yeah, I wish I still owned it, but I don't. <laughs> uh, but to kind of, kind of carry on with the story, I, uh, you know, it was it was a, it was vacant in a wreck. Uh, the guy that owned it was a doctor. He paid all the closing costs, commissions, everything, and he gave me the excess funds in the uh, the uh, escrow account for real estate taxes and insurance, which gave me a some little money to make the payment for a couple of months, some money to fix the place up. Uh, I, you know, I would go to school in the morning. I work for my friend Gary in the afternoon, and in the evenings I'd spend, you know fixing up the one unit, sleeping in the dust and getting up and doing the next day. Uh, and I, you know, within a month I got a tenant which paid the payment and gave me a hundred bucks a month cash flow. And uh, to sort of cut into the story, uh, three years later I built my first 27 unit condominium on North 35th Street in, in Fremont. And I, I did one of those every year for the next uh, four or five years until I went broke. <laughs> 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 and that was the that was the second uh, real estate recession. Uh, I was in the early 1980s. Jimmy Carter inflation years. Interest rates approached 23 percent for home mortgages. That year. wow, wow, that is insane. Mm -hmm. All right, so that is a that is a great intro story. So you 1975, you started you know one du or your first duplex out in Queen Anne. Um, for mm -hmm. those who are not familiar, Queen Anne is probably one of the best areas in Seattle. Um, you got it for twenty thousand. You you fit you helped fix no that money up. down, no money down. I, I and I they gave me the money to make payments for a couple months. Yeah, there you go. No money down, twenty thousand. One of the best areas in Seattle. It's probably worth a couple million at this point. Um, and then from there you went on to building condos. Um, you said 27 units. So, so very large condo, um, complexes. And you did that for a number of years until the next recession hit. And that, uh, that kind of wiped you out. Does that, that summarize the beginning of the, of the, of the journey? Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was, uh, you know, uh, ambition over sense. So, uh, my my objective in those days was to beat Howard S. Wright. I wanted to be a bigger builder than Howard S. Wright, starting from nothing. And I like it. I think they won, but uh, but anyway, I, you know, I gave it. A, it I, I swung the bat. I, I swung for the fences and ended up in a bad place. But you know, uh, sometimes bad things happen, so good things can happen. Absolutely. And, uh, the next uh, part of the story was I had to get my first job. Well, I, I, had a, I had a construction company and I was developing real estate and I was acquiring partners in general partnerships. That's how I developed all those properties. And uh, 
but I, my lender at that time was a company called Seifers Mortgage Corporation, which today is Bank of America. You're probably too young to remember the name Seifers, but uh, yep. the uh, uh, I was hired by Seifers uh, Corporation, Seifers Mortgage Corporation. Uh, the bank was in receivership. It had lost a billion dollars in core capital, lending uh, money to wildcatters in Oklahoma. <laughs> Uh, they were they were under the supervision of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency and being uh, involved in a forced merger with Bank of America. And the mortgage company held a lot of bank-owned properties and, you know, defaulted loans and all kinds of stuff. And uh, the president of that company, Bill Jennings, called me up one day and said, uh, Jim, I understand you may be looking for something to do. I said, you're damn right, Bill. I, I don't have 50 cents to buy another can of beans. What do you got? <laughs> and uh, he, much to my surprise, he wanted to hire me uh, to work as what was called a special credits officer for the, for the mortgage company. And that job entailed, you know, managing uh, defaulted debt, trying to collect it. And uh, so that was the first job that I had as, a, as an adult. And uh, one of my partners, the wife of one of my partners, was kind enough to take me down to Nordstrom's and help me buy a suit. And I learned how to ride the bus from Fremont to downtown. And they gave me a little cubicle down there. And to make a long story short, over, over three years, I collected about $100 million back from the bank. And I, had, I worked on properties from uh, Texas all the way through Alaska, west of the Rockies. And I got to work on properties, every kind of property imaginable. And I had, at any one time, I had 50 or 60 accounts that I was working with. Wow. And uh, included, you know, mid-rise office towers, marinas, apple packing plants, subdivisions, industrial parks, whatever. And I worked with some of the best real estate legal talent and accounting talent in, in was available in the area at the time. And I learned a lot from them. Uh, after that, after three years, I started uh, I guess what you call today a gig worker type of career. Uh, I was involved with Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs, and I was buying and selling as a principal and as a consultant, uh, both performing and non-performing loan portfolios and bank uh, bank mergers and acquisitions. And I did that in North America and Europe for about five years. Got sick of traveling, hated it, and uh, came back, bought my little house in uh, Port Orchard where I live now. And because I didn't know what else to do, I, I got a real estate license and uh, started brokering real estate, which you would think, you know, with that kind of background, I might have had some knowledge about the business, but I really didn't. And <laughs> uh, it, it took me three years of really suffering uh, to learn the business enough to where I could kind of make a go of it. Uh, and I did pretty well up until the next real estate recession. <laughs> Those recessions, they come out of nowhere. <laughs> and keep going, yeah. I call them exogenous <laughs> variables. Uh, uh, but I, uh, I was, you know, uh, I, I, I did, uh, I, one year, I think I sold $40 million in sales. Wow. Uh, so, uh, you know, and it's, and it's kind of bumped along since then. So every recession, I roll out my, my old dusty Rolodex. You know what a Rolodex is? I know what it is. I don't have one, but it's, I do know what a, it is. It's a database on little cards and a little yeah, thing that's rolling around. Old school database. Yeah. And uh, so I, you know, I drag that out periodically when I try to think of what to do. And uh, I uh, decided in uh, 2009, 2010, that I'd become an REO broker. And that's pretty much what I've been doing since then. Perfect. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here because it sounds like we're, we're up to mo modern day. Um, so you were just going to get into it. Um, so right now, what is your, your main bread and butter for your business? Um, you're in foreclosures, REO business. So, so give, give us an, a little, um, you know, overview of what it is that you do, um, in my, you know, today. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm what's called a local listing broker and I list and sell properties for asset managers that represent owners of defaulted properties. That includes the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Chase Bank, uh, uh, Zome Network, which is uh, Mr. Cooper and Nation Star. And so uh, my job is to really to, to list and sell, but I also do 
it involves a fair amount of uh, valuation, inspection, reporting, that sort of thing. So I'm the eyes and ears on the ground for somebody, you know, wherever they are <laughs> that uh, owns large portfolios. So HUD, for instance, will sell this year, will probably sell close to 10,000 properties across the United States and U.S. territories. Wow. So in, in any in any time, whether it's good or bad for, you know, seller's market, uh, there's always foreclosures. There's always short sales, which I do a fair number of. And uh, so my job is to figure out what they're worth, uh, given the constraints, you know, the, the factors that uh, the asset managers tell me to, to look for. And then I have to document everything and I have to prove. It's like going to court every time you take a listing. You got to battle out with uh, people who are reviewing your BPOs. And it, there's always a, a certain dynamic tension that exists in trying to determine what the value is. But here's the good news about REO sellers. They don't care. It's not their money. <laughs> uh, so, but they are very smart, very sophisticated people. Most of them that I've worked for, I'd say all of them. And, uh, you know, they have a, a point of view, uh, but their point of view is informed by big data, by analytics and uh, trends. They're very, very close watchers of data. They're, they use it very effectively. And uh, so, you know, buying REO properties is not so much like sitting down and arm wrestling and negotiation. It's uh, understanding market trends and, you know, rehabilitation values, after repair values, all that. And, I, you know, if, if you were asking me to make an offer for you on an REO property, what I would tell you is you do it your way. You know, you, you figure out what your game is. And it's all about you. It's not about the seller, whoever they are. Uh, and so be consistent in what you do. Uh, be true to, you know, what your, what your, uh, what your strategy strategies is. and your tactics, you know, and, and be true to yourself and always make your offers, um, you know, on, the, on that basis, but try to understand who the seller is and how they work and the better understanding you can develop about the seller and how they work. Uh, the more successful you will be eventually in, you know, buying those types of properties. Perfect. So um, kind of take us in, not everybody is, is or has experience um, with foreclosures. And so can you kind of take us, uh, give us an outline, um, the difference between REO, foreclosures and short sales. Um, what is, what separates those three, those three terms? All right. I think uh, it probably begins, uh, I would say even before a, a borrower, a, an owner of a property with a mortgage, uh, gets into trouble. Uh, you know, there's, they, they might miss a couple of payments. They might be in contact with their lender to try to arrange for forbearance. And uh, so that's kind of the genesis of it. Uh, and, you know, at, if it gets, if that individual cannot find a resolution to their income problem, which is what their central problem is, uh, then, then they have a series of things in Washington state. It's a state by state, uh, affair. So uh, different states have different rules and regulations regarding the process. In the state of Washington, uh, the what's called the non-judicial foreclosure process begins with a notice of default issued by the servicing lender to the defaulted borrower. And approximately five and a half, six months from there is the shortest time that the, that the lender or the servicing uh, lender can arrange for what's called a trustee sale or a short sale, either one of those. Right, excuse me, trustee sale or sheriff sale. And uh, what that means is literally uh, the, the, uh, an employee or, or a contractor hired by the, the trustee that's conducting the legal affairs goes to the courthouse steps, King County, Kitsap County, whichever county it is. Different counties actually have different procedures. In Kitsap County, it's usually on Fridays in the morning. And uh, this person has a bunch of files in their possession. They, they stand around in the lobby at the courthouse and they yell out, I'm here for the trustee sale of such and such. Does anybody want to bid? It's an open outcry uh, auction. And, I love it. And, uh, you know, you if you wish to bid on that property, uh, you can do so, but it's a verbal bid. If your bid is accepted, you have to put up a 5% cash deposit, non-refundable, and bring the rest of the cash within 72 hours. And you get what's called a trustee's deed or a share of sale deed, 
which has very few protections, if any, for the buyer. So it's pretty much a quit claim deed uh, that says, you know, we're, we're uh, conveying our interest to you, but buyer beware. So that's, that's a short, very short uh, description of the foreclosure process. REO properties are properties that have already been foreclosed on. They're, uh, they are properties that where no third party wanted to purchase the property at the auction, the open cry auction at the courthouse steps. And the default bidder is always the lender and they bid the amount that's owed them. So that's the default amount. And, uh, you know, from there, uh, a lot of people are under the misimpression that you can just contact banks uh, and ask them to sell the property to you. It doesn't work that way anymore. Maybe back, you know, when I first started in the 1970s, it did. But uh, right now, uh, most loans, of course, are sold in the secondary mortgage market. So they have uh, bondholder interests and restrictions and uh, indentures. Uh, and there's a servicing lender and there's the owner of the net and there's bondholders. So there's a whole chain of, of servicing and, and ownership of that debt uh, to where there's nobody's directly responsible for it. But uh, people who are in charge of, of uh, resolving that debt hire asset managers to manage the properties. And they, they look first to those asset managers to provide valuation and services and, and insight as to how to market that property and what they can expect. And, and only when it's gone through that process and through a legal process to guarantee that they have marketable title do they offer the property on the market. Now they can offer that property many, many different ways. Uh, most desirable for most owners of large numbers of defaulted debt is they want to do what are called bulk sales. So they'll, they'll call up, you know, Goldman Sachs or Wall Street firm or people they know who are well capitalized, well funded. And they will, they will say, you know, we've got a portfolio here of non-performing loans or REO properties. Would you like to, would you like to make an offer on them? That's what I did back in the eighties, mid eighties uh, for Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs. And uh, so very often their, their preferred choice, if they could get enough is to sell these defaulted properties in bulk to, to an investor. And, and then there are certain covenants which those investors must uh, agree to, uh, usually regulations, federal regulations, state regulations. And then they buy them and they do whatever they want with them, which may be renting them. It could be uh, just reselling them. It could be adding value and reselling, you know, whatever that investor chooses to do. An interesting thing for smaller investors is if you can if you can find a way to network with those bulk purchasers, very often they want to they want to subcontract to local investors. You know, let's say they're buying a portfolio on the West Coast, all the states on the West Coast. And they want to find more local investors in each state to take a portion of it. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm Sorry. gonna try my best to try to summarize um, everything that you just said. Um, and so stop me when I'm wrong and and correct me. Um, so we have the three terms. We've got REO, foreclosure, and short sale. Um, the foreclosure is is the process of somebody stopping paying on their on their loan um, and the bank selling that. And you would go to the actual you know the courthouse steps in order to buy that. Um, if nobody buys it on the courthouse steps, if nobody actually you know decides that it's a viable property, then it becomes an REO property. It's owned by the bank. Um, and so where does short sale come into that? When does it become a short sale? Yeah, a short sale is an option uh, for a defaulted borrower prior to a trustee's sale. Okay. Actually, in the state of Washington, they have a number of options. Uh, I'll explain that one in more detail, but... Uh, the state of Washington in circa 2010 uh, passed a new law that was the Homeowners Protection Act, I think it was called. And it uh, requires servicing lenders to appoint a single po point of contact to a uh, borrower and be an authority, somebody that can sign. Uh, and if, if that defaulted borrower requests arbitration, and so you can, you can request arbitration of that loan. And a number of people did that. And uh, not all of them worked out, but some people saved their homes by, you know, getting, getting some kind of a workout on, on being able to repay it. Uh, another option is bankruptcy. 
but a, but a pretty good option and the one that's most used, uh, that's most beneficial actually for the, for the defaulted borrowers, what's called a short sale. And so they, they engage the, uh, the, the servicing lender. They, uh, it would, it's most beneficial to the borrower if they can hire legal counsel to help them. There are also free HUD approved housing counselors that you can talk to who will help you somewhat with the process. But the, but the, and brokers, of course, can do this. Uh, but you want to engage the lender. You want some time. You want to request some time to sell the property or whatever you can get for it. And you, when you get an offer, you present that offer to the asset manager that's working for the lender. And very often in a short sale, the net sales proceeds of that offer are less than the total amount owed. That's why it's called a short sale. It's short the amount to pay yep. off the loan in full. And uh, depending on their models, on their economic models that they use to evaluate, they may accept that because they determine that short sales, and, and, and actually the data was pretty clear in the 2010 era that uh, lenders are very often came out to better advantage uh, by doing a short sale than going through the foreclosure process. Interesting. So, okay. So they have okay. they have a they have an incentive to do that. Okay. So um, for anybody for any of the investors that are listening or watching to the show, um, if they want to start getting involved in buying um, foreclosed or short sale properties or REO properties, what um, what's the best what's the best way to go about um, you know getting getting in front of those properties? I know you said for foreclosures um, you got to go to the courthouse. That's how you buy them. Um, and there's also like auction.com, et cetera, but, but you actually buy them by bidding on the, um, you know, at the courthouse steps. So for what are the other ways that people can go about buying REO short sale and, uh, and foreclosed properties? Uh, well, I, I would say most of the time, probably, you know, 97% plus of the time, uh, those properties are listed with brokers. Okay. So uh, unfortunately for people who like to deal, <laughs> you know, directly, uh, the, the best path is through the MLS and certain websites. Um, so that's, that's really the first step. It's not hard to find them. And if you're working with a broker that knows how to do it, uh, you can get them to set you up in an automatic notification process for new listings like that. Uh, all that said, it, uh, those pickings have been pretty slim uh, for the last, well, since 2013, when home prices began rising in Western Washington. Uh, however, everybody's sort of anticipating a return to the, you know, the bad old days uh, of people losing their homes, which doesn't make me happy. Yeah. Uh, but it does provide more inventory for people who are looking to purchase. Yep. Okay. Um, so what the, we keep this episode or these podcasts about 20 to 30 minutes. So we're kind of nearing the end of our, um, our show here, but um, before we do, before we move on from your, uh, you know, how you deal um, y- your specific business um, kind of tell us, you mentioned earlier um, that you, one of your jobs was to figure out the worth of the properties. Um, just give us a real brief overview. Like what is the process that banks use um, um, to identify the, the, the worth of the property um, when they go into foreclosure? Any and all of the options available. So the uh, HUD, for instance, uh, will will uh, commission an FHA appraisal of the property. Uh, they will use automated valuation models. They will use BPOs or brokers' price opinions, and they might get several of those for a single property. And that process is ongoing. It doesn't stop at the listing period. If they list a property and it's not selling, they, they continuously go through a valuation process trying to uh, determine the right price. Gotcha. Okay. All right. We're going to shift gears here just a little bit. Um, we've, you know, we've covered the nuts and bolts of your business, what you do, you're a broker. Um, you do a lot with the uh, foreclosures, REO, short sale properties. Um, so now kind of take us, I want to hear a little bit more about the experiences. Um, I mean, you know, more than anybody else, real estate is, it's a roller coaster, both financially and emotionally. You got mm-hmm. your ups, you got your downs. Um, it seems like you've, you've seen both the ups and the downs. So um, kind of take us to one of the da- one of the one of the lower parts, um, maybe that the the condos that you dealt with, and what was the what was the best lesson that you learned from that experience? You know, uh, I I sort of thought you might answer ask me that question, uh, and you know the the more I do, the more the longer I stay in this business, it seems the less I know. <laughs> uh, but the 
the uh, what I would say about it is it's all up here. It's all up here. And the good news point to the head. Yep. Point to the head. And the good news about the real estate business is it's so big and so diverse and everybody needs a place to live. Most businesses need a domicile to, to operate their business. So there's always a demand for property. And there, you know, there are many, many things, professional services or ways to invest. You can buy equity, you can buy debt, you can uh, syndicate, you can, you can be a sole proprietor, you know, there are all sorts of ways to approach it. So if whatever you're doing isn't working at the moment, take a little time, just a little time, not too long, <laughs> and uh, sort, sort out the head stuff and sort out your options and then go do it. Go do it. I had uh, the privilege, I was at a, a reception one time uh, held by Seafirst Mortgage Corporation and a gentleman by the name of Martin Selig was there. And maybe you don't know Martin, but he, he was responsible for building most of the high-rise office towers in downtown Seattle. Oh, wow. He built the Columbia Center, for instance, for, uh, uh, and which is where I was at, in office there. Uh, but so I, I got a chance to meet him. I think my loan officer at Seafirst Mortgage Corporation wanted me to, to meet him and he introduced me. And I was just a little scumbag developer, you know, I, I still strap the tools on and go out working my projects. But, uh, <laughs> Martin, Martin was kind enough to talk to me for a minute. And uh, I walked up to him, shook hands, and he said, he said this to me, son, whatever it is, just do it. And that was the total sum of our conversation. And, <laughs> Wise and I, words. Well, really, I mean, you know, it's simple, but, uh, uh, you know, he, that, that was his life. That's how he got things done and achieved things. And I'm sure that, that any person who achieves something starts with nothing and they have to go, they have to challenge themselves. They have to go above and beyond <coughs> their own uh, comfort zones and what they know at the time. I certainly knew nothing about what I was doing when I bought that duplex. Um, but you just learn and you, you know, you're going to pay a price. You're going to pay a price and you can be a little bit more careful and whatever, maybe not suffer like I've suffered. But, you know, it's not just about making money. It's, it's, it's about learning. It's about service. It's becoming a servant leader. It's, it's uh, giving people opportunities to, to be better than what they are. I like it. Just do it. It just sums it up uh, so well. Very, very, very short and to the point. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you got started. Um, we're going to close it out here with one last question um, before, I, before I ask, uh, you know, how people can get in contact with you. Um, so you started out in 1975. Um, this was the gym, you know, the, just doing one single duplex. Um, if you could go back to that guy um, and just give him one piece of advice, kind of like uh, um, Martin had given you, what would be that piece of advice be? Uh, good question. I don't know that I have a good answer to it. I'm still, I'm still learning and I still don't know enough. And so I'm, I'm challenging myself every day with, you know, new initiatives, things that tweaks or even major initiatives that, that are changing what I do on a daily basis and how I operate. Uh, so I, I guess, you know, I would say keep up the good work. <laughs> keep moving. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Just do it. <laughs> Just do it. All right. Well, Jim, thank you very much um, for, for jumping on here and sharing your wisdom. Um, I'm sure I can speak uh, for everybody listening and watching that we appreciate um, you sharing everything that you've, uh, you've given us so far. Um, so, I mean, you need things too. So if anybody, if, what is it that somebody could bring you um, that you would want? You know, I, I'm just very, I'm, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you and whoever's going to be watching this. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm all about networking. So if somebody has an idea or a question, you know, I'll be happy to talk to them, no cost, no obligation. Uh, and I have a pretty good network of very highly professional, caring people. And we, we share, uh, you know, a commitment to respect and transparency and honesty. And, you know, if you're that type of person, you just want to talk to me and see if there's something we can do together, get a hold of me. Awesome. And, uh, and if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, what, what would be the best way for them to reach out to you? Uh, they can certainly uh, email me, I guess. Uh, Jim Freeman, J-I-M-F-R-E-E-M-A-N at jimfreeman.com. 
Jim Freeman, J-I-M-F-R-E-E-M-A-N at jimfreeman.com. All right, there you heard it. So again, thank you for coming on and um, everybody listening and watching. We'll look forward to seeing you guys on the next episode. Thank you for joining us on the Real Estate Investing Club. If you've watched this far, I'm sure you've gotten a little bit of value out of this. So we would appreciate it if you hit that thumbs up, share it with your friends or family, whatever it may be. And if you'd like to share or partner with us on a deal, we absolutely love partnering on deals and are always looking for quality projects. Go to www.therealestateinvestingclub.com to get in contact with one of our partners. Otherwise, I hope you guys have an absolutely fantastic day and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.